Two years ago, I made a new friend. We had lunch together here in Orange County, myself, him, and his wife. I heard some of his story about his ministry as a pastor in Portland, Oregon, but then I found out something really encouraging. He was working on a book on the theme of hurry. That friend is John Mark Comer, and the book, which came out last October, is titled The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I can't wait to share our conversation about that book today on the Unhurried Living Podcast. There have been a few books written on the subject of hurry, both before and after an unhurried life. But I have to say that my favorite is now John Mark Comer's The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I read it rather quickly once it arrived. I think it was two or three sittings. It was such a pleasure to have a conversation with John Mark about the story behind his book and to interact about some of his key insights about following Jesus' unhurried way of life and work. John Mark Comer lives, works, and writes in the urban core of Portland, Oregon, with his wife Tammy and their three children, Jude, Moses, and Sunday. He is the pastor for teaching and vision at Bridgetown Church and has a master's degree in biblical and theological studies from Western Seminary. John Mark is also the author of My Name is Hope, Loveology, and Garden City. By the way, in the course of our conversation, you'll probably notice that I end up retitling John Mark's book from The Ruthless Elimination to The Relentless Elimination of Hurry. I suppose it's true that we need to be as relentless as we are ruthless as we eliminate hurry from our lives, and I'm grateful John Mark was patient and gracious with my mistake. And I know you're going to enjoy our conversation. John Mark, it is a great treat to be able to have this conversation and especially about your book, uh, The Relentless Elimination of Hurry. Yeah, such a joy to be with you, Alan. And just, if nothing else, an excuse to chat. If not in person, at least I see your smiling face over the internet. Yeah, well, it's a treat. I'll tell you, I I was, um, uh, I've been enjoying it. I got my copy about, I think, four days ago or so. And uh, I just wanted you to know it has been a delight to read. It is a a beautiful book. It's a well-written book. I love your pastoral heart. I love your honesty as you write. You've done some great research. There's some good, deep uh, roots in this book. So I just want to say thank you for writing it. No, you're so kind. It feels so weird to do this conversation with you. So I don't know if I've told you this story, but a couple of years ago, so I basically, I, it's a very long story, but I wrote this book like almost three years ago. Is that right? Very long story. There was a delay in publication. So it's just, um, at least I started writing it, you know, two and a half, three years ago. Yeah. And I'd written most of the rough draft, most of the book. And I got into a conversation with um, Bobby Schuler. Do you know Bobby who's down here? Sure. Your Bobby's down in our neighborhood. And he's like, hey, what are you writing about? And I said, oh, I'm doing this thing on this book on hurry. And, it, and I'm like, there's just nothing out there. Nobody. I, I can't find anybody writing about this. And he goes, <laughs> well, what about Alan Fadling's book? And I'm like, Al- Alan who? who? <laughs> he's like, well, you've read this, right? I'm like, uh, what? No, I had no idea. That's so hilarious. I immediately went out and bought your first book, uh, you know, Unhurried Life. And I wrote it, I read it and it was wonderful, but I hated it. Not because it wasn't wonderful. It was amazing. It was just basically the book that I had just written, but much better. <laughs> oh, well now so, you're being kind. So <laughs> no, I, I was so mad. I was like, like, wait a minute, this is my book, but better. This is not fair. But at that point I'd already written it and was contractually obligated. I had to still turn it in. <laughs> So secret oh. to the internet, if you want to pick between two books on hurry, just read Allen's and it's <laughs> older and wiser and more mature and thoughtful. And no, seriously, I, I so enjoyed mm. it, but I also fun secret fact for the internet. I've disciplined myself to not read your second book, which I've been dying to read in a hurried leader, just yeah. so I don't plagiarize you. <laughs> <laughs> so you I've go. been literally waiting until next week after the book comes out to read an unhurried leader. So I can't oh. wait to read it. I'm so excited, but I had to, oh. I wanted to read it the last two vacations in summer. It's a great summer read. And I've, yeah. I've said, Nope, you got to wait. You got to wait that way. <laughs> if anybody accuses you of plagiarism, I can just say, I've not read Never it. read it. I just I have no happened idea upon the same it. content, man. That's all. Yes. Yeah, so, all I can so, say. So I know what you mean. Reading that. 
Yeah, when I when I wrote uh, An Unhurried Leader, I can think of another book on very, very similar themes, the integration of emotionally yeah. healthy and leadership, you might have a yeah. sense of. Yes. And I, I said to myself, I will not read his book because I know, well, I know, I think we're probably going to cross some similar paths. And exactly. I was grateful because not in the same way, but of course, we're we're talking in the same sort of neighborhood. Of yeah. course, we're going to stumble across the same passages and maybe some of the same historical voices and yep ideas and the same yep. spirit i kind of hope maybe is you know guiding us in uh, the yes. work that we do 100 so percent. yeah i totally get what you're saying well as far as the book goes i i love that you just titled it you know dallas willard's yes famous line came potent, iconic line oh that mm -hmm. was i well you know that was one of the seeds for sure of the book i wrote yeah. That and, you know, the conversations that he and John would, yes. would have had together. A lot of those lines, John's chapter, you yes. know, life you've always wanted, all of that. Uh, those were all seeds for me to wrestle with first yes. in my life. And so I would love, I always love to hear sort of the genesis of a book. And you, you actually sort of start there as you begin the book, telling a little yes. bit of your own story. I'd love maybe for you to tell some of that as much as makes sense in a podcast. So people can kind of get a feel for where this book grows out of. Uh, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, my story is not all that unique. You know, it's a pretty common trope of burned out pastor kind of thing. Yeah. I planted a church a number of years ago on a team and it grew really fast. And um, in not very long at all, it was a mega church and it kept growing. And by the time I was, you know, 30, 31, I think at our height, we had 93 people on staff and multiple different locations and all this stuff. And so by external American metrics of success, things were going great. Yeah. Um, by all of the internal metrics of the kingdom of God, it was not well, you know, there was the emotional issues of I was burned out anxious all the time on it. I was not a happy person and did not like who I was becoming, you know, and there was, there was some serious issues. I don't know that I would say mental health, but definitely with, you know, emotional health for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, on a much more important level, and the reason I think emotional health matters so much, I think in some ways it's a means to an end. That's too utilitarian a way to say it, but is for spiritual health, like what it was doing, what that pace of life, what that way of living was doing to my soul and its capacity both to receive love from God and to give love to others, it was basically sabotaging both and, you know, on the, on the God word direction. And again, that's probably not a helpful bifurcation, but in my awareness of and connection to the spirit of God and his love, it was just sabotaging that I was just in a hurry all the time on my phone, distracted, working insane hours I, I have a very like disciplined regimen of spiritual disciplines of the evangelical variety, not a holistic yep. kind of thing. And I'm sure similar to you, I was raised yep. into some disciplines incredibly well and others were not even on my radar screen. So like a morning quiet time, which I'm so sad when I hear people mock that in a cynical or dismissive way, it's still an anchor point to my day. Yeah. Really raised well into that, raised well into scripture, even raised well into Lectio Divina and other things. But then other things like, you know, Sabbath or the examine <laughs> or fasting. Some of these things were not even on my radar, you know? Yeah. So um, it was really sabotaging my capacity to experience God as I became more and more just sped up and in a hurry when I would actually come down to create these little, mo you know, spaces to come back to God. My, my brain just was, it was just spun out of control. My body wasn't there. I just, I couldn't feel, sense, hear, interact with God at his pace because I wasn't have you come across that um, quote from the Japanese theologian who, oh yeah, man, I'm, I'm three embarrassed. mile an hour God. Yes. And he, I love, he's a beautiful line about how God walks slowly because God is love. Yep. And that, you know, three mile hour God which is the title of his book. It's just an essay in his book, but yeah. you know, basically argues God walks at three miles per hour. That's the pace of walking because God is love and, yep. and love has its own speed It's an inner speed. It is a speed of love, you know, yep. something to that. I love that. So I just wasn't, walking i wasn't walking at all much less walking at the the speed of love and then of course that was just massively sabotaging all of my interpersonal relationships mm. who i was with my wife with my children with you know staff with close friends was not somebody who was compassionate present to the moment attentive and loving it was somebody who was in a hurry 
angry a lot, agitated a lot. Some of that's, you know, what hurry does to my specific personality and, um, and just didn't have time to listen, wasn't present, was hypersensitive, critical, you know, striving. It's like all the stuff, you know? So unfortunately yeah. it was just the common millennial trope of, uh, you know, I, I gained a church and lost my soul. And, yeah. and then the problem wasn't church. Like people often take that into some cynical anti-church thing. And I haven't gone that direction. I don't think it's helpful. No. I think the problem was was much deeper than church, and it was just it was manifesting in the way that I was doing church, yeah. but it was much deeper than that. It was in my soul, and so yeah, I just basically had an early midlife crisis <laughs> and realized, okay, something serious has to change, and and that that's a very long, complex story. But a key part of that was coming across the story of Dallas Willard and John Ortberg and his iconic line, "You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Hurry is the great enemy." of spiritual life in our day and beginning to connect the dots between hurry and what was going on in my soul at an emotional and spiritual level. Yeah, no, that so much of that rings true. You know, when I tell the story of kind of my own yeah. Genesis, it's not that far off from kind of where you find yourself in terms of, you know, life journey. It was for me, right. it was late twenties wow. and I wasn't in nearly the same sort of a scenario as you were, in in terms of ministry, but I was burning out too for my own yeah. reasons. And I so I often think that recovery from hurry, I, I wish it weren't this way, but often it comes uh because you just can't do what you're doing anymore the way yeah. you're doing it. It doesn't work. It doesn't. It flat doesn't. And, and yeah, I'm, people sometimes think of like I, you know, because I ended up stepping down from this mega church and and not leaving, but just, it's kind of a long story, but demoting yeah. myself. And people often think of it as like a virtuous thing, like, oh, it's so Christ-like to reject the American <laughs> metrics of mega church, whatever. And it wasn't really that virtuous. I burned out, yeah. you know, and um, I had to make a change. I mean, I, I could have kept going on, but the person that I was becoming was horrific, you know? Yeah. And so I'm like, I had no desire to become that person. And I would imagine that for you, you must get front row seats to it, not only in your own life, but as a spiritual director, working with pastors across the age spectrum, you must just see this play out over and over and over again. Is that, I mean, is that your sense yeah. or no? No, it is. And, uh, you know, for me now, it's not just in the North American context or in the Western context, but, right. you know, in, in, um, in July, we're in Uganda. I got to wow. be with all the bishops and the archbishop of the Church of Uganda. You're kidding me. Wow. My daughter is you know, so, Ugandan. So oh, that's a uh, special place in my heart. We're going there next year. It's that's a beautiful fun. church. You know, so these are beautiful couples yep. who care for 100, 200, 400 churches. The wow. Church of Uganda, about one out of every three Ugandans is a part of that church. Wow. And the most beautiful moment, maybe of my life, certainly in recent memory, was in the rather dense schedule they gave me because they set the schedule. And then I came and my wife and I actually came in and sort of were there to serve them in a two-day retreat. Um, the most beautiful moment was we carved out an hour and I asked them, this is all I want you to do. Go out to the lawn somewhere, sit in the lawn, look at the beauty of what God's made, let God's spirit in whatever way God's spirit would like to speak to your heart. And, and this was the part that really sort of uh, shocked them. I said, and I'm going to suggest that you even step away from one another as a couple. So the mama bishops, you go find your own little piece of lawn and the bishops, you go find your piece of lawn <laughs> and we'll spend an hour in the presence, enjoying the presence of God. I mean, so my vision was this vision of purple shirts all across the lawn. Wow. And then we came back and we just heard a few of the stories and you know, these are godly, godly couples. Yes, yes. They are people of prayer. All of that and just the simplicity of the Christian life as a friendship with Jesus that I have time for. Yeah. This in the press of responsibility, in the press of wanting to be, a, wanting to be um, faithful to the calling of Jesus to ministry as we've come to understand it, perhaps. Yeah that time gets crowded. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think maybe kind of the next question this leads me to is you were drawn to a very similar place I found myself drawn to in terms of what is the strategic hub of this becoming unhurried? And, 
And I came to believe it was a matter of discipleship or apprenticeship yeah. to Jesus, that Jesus himself lives unhurried, pre-technology or otherwise. Yes. His way of living is genius, absolutely yep. genius. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what that's looked like for you to be apprenticed to, you know, an unhurried savior in Jesus. Yeah. I mean, I mean, first off, I just could not agree more. When I read the four gospels, the, the portrait of Jesus that comes through the pages to me, at least in my reading of it, is of an unhurried leader in your language. Mm. You know, I mean, I just don't think he was in a hurry. I mean, how many of the gospel stories, I don't have a percentage here, but are interruptions, yeah. you know? And um, what was it? Was it C.S. Lewis who said how you react in an interruption is who you really are? Yeah. And which is which is bad news when I think about it for me. Oh, ouch. But, um, you know, I mean, so many of the stories are interruptions to Jesus life and his day. And and that's where that's where the light gets in through the cracks. You know, it's yeah. so beautiful. And so Jesus life is very full. It, you could even argue is busy, depending on how you define busyness. And this, I think there's a healthy kind of busyness and an unhealthy kind of busyness. And um, I think his was the healthy kind for sure. But I just don't think he was in a hurry. I think when I read about Jesus, he seems so present to the moment, so present to the person in front of him, to his own soul, so aware of what God is doing in each moment, mm-hmm. you know. And um, and from the tradition that grows up around Jesus, the way of Jesus or Christianity or whatever you want to call it, as you know, we have thousands of years now of time-tested practices, disciplines, habits, sacred rhythms, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. That go back to the lifestyle of Jesus himself that organize and orient our whole life around this kind of, you know, what he called abiding. And so those disciplines, which in particular, are some of the what, you know, Foster would call the disciplines of abstinence, you know, it's like silence and solitude and Sabbath and simplicity saying no. I find those incredibly helpful in the modern world with the phone and all that kind of stuff. That I think we have to augment and adapt them for the digital age. Yeah. But also one of the things I love about Jesus is just his vision of life in the kingdom and the primacy of love yeah. and of joy. You know, I've been thinking a lot about, I don't know what you think of this, Alan, but um, the gospel of John's portrait of Jesus and Jesus teachings there and kind of that trifecta that comes up in the second half of the gospel of John of love and joy and peace and how Jesus is just circling around these themes of, Love, a new command I give you, love one another. And he just says it and says it and says it and joy. I mean, multiple times that your joy may overflow, you know, peace, my peace, I leave with you. These three kind of qualities, not just emotions, but like qualities, the kinds of people that we become. And then how Paul plays with that. And, you know, his whole, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And righteousness, if you don't interpret it necessarily in the reformational kind of sense of moral merit, but you more interpret it in the sense of love and transformation to love um, and goodness and that love joy. And then of course, Paul expands on the list in Galatians five, the fruit of the spirit. So I've just been thinking about love, joy, and peace as the central vision of Jesus for life in the kingdom. And all three of them are incompatible with hurry. That's absolutely Hurried people are not loving, hurried people are not joyful and hurried people are definitely not a non-anxious presence of deep shalom in the world, you know? Absolutely. So if I want to live into love, joy, and peace in the kingdom, I I can't do that and live a life of speed. I have, I have to pick. And so that's where I find Jesus, both his practice and his vision. So compelling. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I remember I I started doing some travel and I, and I was sharing some of these practices like solitude and silence or, um, or Sabbath, for example. And so one thing I began to realize is I began to talk about leaders uh, activities and leaders receptivities. Mm. And that for me was a way to sort of get at that rhythm of engagement and disengagement that I think Dallas did such a beautiful job of highlighting for us. Yes. So often we define leadership only as a list of activities, Mm -hmm. but there's an opportunity to cultivate a sense of, what are the receptivities? Jesus yep. withdraws to a lonely place to be in the presence of the Father who calls him the beloved. That's a receptivity that he regularly yes. practices. These are the patterns that sadly for me were not modeled early on. Yes. In, by and those it, was who, all, it was all engagement, but none of the slip away, rest, be quiet, sit before God and his love. It was just all do, do, do kind of thing. Absolutely. And so yeah. 
when I started discovering some of these, this was almost 30 years ago, I got labeled the staff mystic. And I will just tell <laughs> you, that was not a nice word yeah, to that, be that used. Was, that was not a compliment. No, it was probably not unlike the first followers of Jesus being called Christians. Yes. And that wasn't exactly <laughs> a welcome label, except they owned it. No, and I started it, to yeah. decide, you know what? If mystic means somebody who's serious about communion with God and the experience of the mystery of God's presence and wanting to lean into that, then maybe heck I, yes. I'll have to own it then. Yeah, I love that definition of mystic as somebody who wants to experience practically what is tr- true of them theologically. Yes. So, you know, we're in Christ, but most busy Christians in the Western world have no experiential or very little experiential knowledge of that theological truth that they are in Christ. Yeah. So if a mystic is one who just wants to experience what is true of them. Yeah. I like that. I do too. I agree. I just think if, if our evangelical heritage has been about inviting people to a personal relationship with God through trusting Jesus, I'd like them to experience it. Yeah. And, you know, I wonder how much of it is a generational thing, too, because I think that the evangelicals tradition or stream has such a long standing like emphasis on devotional practice. And that's one of the things that marked it out is like we're not just going to go to church and identify as whatever. We're actually going to seek God. And I, I think some of it, we, we often I think we we misidentify the, the culprit often. I think some of it is that, you know, um, spiritual, what's the, you know, what's the phrase? Spiritual disciplines are caught more than they are taught. And a lot of them were handed down through the familial and cultural architecture, like Sabbath. You didn't have to really teach Sabbath until recently because there was a Sabbath, like everything shut down. It was illegal until very recently to open a business. I mean, my dad who's 69 years old, grew up in what's now called Silicon Valley. At the time, it wasn't called that. Sure. And he tells stories about growing up in the Bay Area and how everything was closed on Sunday. Absolutely. Everybody went to church. He wasn't even a Christian. Their family wasn't Christian. They would go to like a mainline, you know, love is God kind of church. He had no idea who Jesus or the gospel. But they would go to church every Sunday. You were either Catholic, oh, yeah. Protestant, or mainline. And then after church, there was, no, there was nothing to do. There was no email. There was no TV. There was no shopping. You just take a nap, be with your family. If you're really liberal, maybe you go down to the park and throw the baseball or something, you know? <laughs> but, and so like, I don't think that his church would have needed to run this huge like series on Sabbath. It was just like built into the cultural architecture. You could argue that about morning quiet time, about family, about community, about, so about simplicity. You know what I mean? People didn't have the upwardly mobile lifestyle they have now in greater numbers. So I think a lot of it is generational and that it was just built into the cultural architecture and so much has changed from the death of the Sabbath in the 60s to I think the climax is the release of the iPhone, you know, 11, yeah. 12 years ago. Um, that, ha- that has called, I think, for a whole new moment where we really have to go back to our, our roots and our tradition in the way of Jesus and call on some of these practices to find a new way forward. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And uh you know, you raise this this matter of, uh, you know, the, the smartphone, the iPhone that shows yes. up about a dozen years ago. I've been sort of calling this our experiment in, you know, human omnipresence. I love that language. Consider it stolen in, a, in an upcoming sermon Please at Bridgetown do. Church. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you. Uh, and I and I realize, you know, there is this sort of godlike thing that happens to us yes. in terms of what this device makes possible, you know, that. When I, I mean, my childhood is a little bit of your, maybe your father's experience yeah. that you're describing. Um, I'm a child of the 60s. And so where I lived, you know, three channels of TV and, uh, you know, Sundays, you couldn't go buy anything because nothing yeah. was open, you know. Right. Uh, so, but I think I'd love for, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, Okay, now we have smartphones and, you know, here's my iPhone right here in my hand and just right. about everybody listening probably has a smartphone in theirs. And how do we help our friends, those who are listening to us here, how do we help them find the unhurried way of Jesus in the midst of the practical ways in which this device mentors us in the opposite if we if we let it? Yeah, um, I mean, again, I don't have all the answers to that. I think, again, we're just a decade in. 
And we don't have, I think, the Amish sensibility. You know, I love how the Amish, it's such a misnomer that they don't use technology. It's not actually true. That's right. They actually, they, they're very selective and they, there is a lot of technology they fully use, but they use us as human guinea pigs. When mm -hmm. a new technology comes to the fore, they watch what it does to us. They watch what it does to our soul and society for a while. And then they have a communal conversation about whether or not it will make their life better or worse. And yeah. so the car is, and you know, we forget the car is a recent thing. Amish are a lot older than the car. And they looked at what the car did to American society and to the soul and decided, no, this would fragment our community. This would add stress. This would tear us apart from each other. Same with insurance and other things like that. And I have no idea what they think of the smartphone, but I can only imagine. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I'm not recommending that we need to go Amish, but I think there's, a, there's an intelligence there that when a new technology comes, you know, the American mantra, because it wants to capitalize and make money off of us, it just wants us to think newer is better equals buy everything. Yeah. And I, don't, I think that's a stupid way to live. That's yeah. a, an easily manipulated by capitalistic agenda way to live. And I think the intelligent way to live is to when a new technology comes, um, just wait a while, see what happens, see what that does, and see if you can have an objective time Will this make my life, my soul, and our society better or worse? So, again, most of us are just way beyond that, you know, myself included. We just come up in that newer is better. Oh, there's a new gadget. Let's get it. Everybody has it. Therefore, let's do it. So at that point, um, I think that we – my personal opinion – again, I don't have all the answers here, and I don't think this is a silver bullet without some massive societal, you know, costs like the Amish who pay a pretty high cost – yeah. For what for their engagement or lack of engagement, I do think that one simple solution to begin is crafting what I'm just calling a digital rule of life. Mm -hmm. So rule of life is not language to, new that's new to you. It is new language for a lot of evangelicals, but it's more and more common. We're about to teach on it in the next couple of weeks at our church, and I think as part of that, we need to create a digital rule of life where mm -hmm. your phone becomes a tool that you use rather than. Uh, you know, a master, an addiction, uh, you know, because right now we're the tool, we're the product. We think the phone's exactly. the product, we bought it, but actually it bought us. We're the, we're the product, you know, at a, just that economic level. Yeah. That's the business plan. So, um, so I think that, I think a place to begin is twofold. One with, I think followers of Jesus need to recognize the reality that the phone is a serious threat to their spiritual life. And if you don't recognize that, if you live in denial of that, you're never going to get anywhere. Two, once people, I think, recognize that fact, I think it's a fact. It could be just my opinion. I think it's reality. Two, I think we need to craft some kind of a digital rule of life. So I've come up with one, mm. you know, um, practices, habits, rules, schedule things. So like a core thing for us is we call it, I think we stole this language from Andy Crouch. Have you read his little book, The TechWise Family? I'm, I'm familiar with it, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's again, it's for families, a short little read, and it's basically on this idea, crafting a, you know, I don't think he uses this language, but a digital rule of life. So I think I stole this language from him, but we just say that we parent our phones, meaning, you know, a good parent, at least with littler kids, your kids go to bed before you go, I'm sorry, they go to bed before you go to bed and they wake up after you wake up so that you can be yeah. a healthy human being. So we parent our phones. Our phones go to bed at 8.30 every night. We put them in a closet by themselves, plugged in. Not by, they're not our alarm clocks. They're not in our bedroom. They're not next to our beds, which they are for 90% of Americans. In a recent study that I just read, 90% of Americans, the first thing they do when they wake up is turn on their phone. Yeah. Neuroscientists are telling us all this stuff about how the last thing you do before you go to sleep and the first thing you do when you wake up has the greatest neurological impact on the plasticity of your brain and how your brain is wired, which is just terrifying. It's the last thing we do is watch Netflix. And the yeah. first thing we do is read a tweet from Donald Trump, check our email, get in trouble with our boss, peruse Instagram, see the life that we wish we had and didn't, and then read about the social media outrage of the day. What in the world is that doing to our brain, yeah. our neurobiology, our soul? Who are we becoming through that? That's a spiritual discipline, even oh, if it's it one sure is. deformation. Deforming deformation. one. Yeah. So I think simple rules like goes to bed before we do, and then I, I, we don't touch it until we've spent, and again, this is our stage of life, but time in the quiet with God, yeah. psalms in prayer, and getting our kids off to school with love and blessing and all that, and then we'll, 
then we'll open the beast. And so I have a pretty rigorous one, you know, text message bundling is part of it. No alerts on my phone. I've turned my smartphone into a dumb phone, digital Sabbath, like, you know, so mine is pretty rigorous, but you can start wherever, where you're at, wherever you're at. Yeah. And then I think, you know, because it is an addiction and because they're designed for addiction, it's literally designed to addict you. Yeah. So I don't think it's something we can just do us and Jesus. I think we have to come in with community accountability tools stuff like that. But it's a, it's a massive problem. I don't think there's an easy solution to it. Well, I think at least one of the things that we have to remind ourselves that is that this is a powerful, powerful. tool. Powerful, yep. And that power can be used well, or that power can be used poorly. And I think you've made some really good points. For me, for example, uh, this is my library. This is where the phone lives when, yep. you know, when I go to bed upstairs. And uh, yeah. I have seasons where, like you, I don't have any little red circles on my phone telling me how far behind I am, you know. Right. It doesn't beep or boop or buzz or anything. None of that stuff, yeah. And I I need that because all of those things are sort of training me in distraction and they're training me in a lack of attention. Potential. And I I think we just are way too naive about what this what this thing is. You know, I read a fascinating study recently from the University of Virginia on this is on like a tangent, but on aggression hmm. in men and women. And it was fascinating. Secular study, not remotely conservative, religious. There was no political agenda to it. But the summary that I read concluded that it's a total myth that men are more aggressive than women. Hmm. That as a general rule, the levels of aggression are the same. But at, And of course, this is not politically correct to say, but that men and women tend to display aggression differently across the bell curve men tend to display it through you know physical aggression force fighting violence even and women tend to tend to again this is bell curve data stuff um they tend to express aggression i forget the language they use but something to do with boundary keeping meaning subtle at times passive more than overt Mm. um drawing lines around who's in who's out who's acceptable who's not like so different tactics and then it's really interesting. The writers of the study concluded it was a fascinating takeaway. They said if you wanted to destroy an entire generation of adolescent boys, you would all you'd have to do is put a gun in their front right pocket. Mm. And if you wanted to destroy an entire generation of adolescent girls, all you'd have to do is put an iPhone with Instagram in their front right pocket. Oh boy. And I thought it was so interesting that for all of the political controversy, we have strict laws and social mores around a weapon like a gun. And you you wouldn't like give a 12 year old a gun and let them carry it to school and have it in their room. But we have no laws and almost no social mores around phone, Wi-Fi and social media. And I, I think I'm hoping that we get to this point as a society where similar with alcohol or drugs or weapons, we realize, all right, there, there may be a place for some of this stuff, but man, we have to, we have to literally, re- we have to treat this as something that has potential for, for harm and for danger. And we need, a, we need to treat our phone the way we would treat, I don't know, you know, something dangerous. And um, that doesn't mean it shouldn't be used, but it means it needs to be used really cautiously and with wisdom and self-control. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I think that's important. I think that we have to, we're going to have to address this. I just think five, 10, 20 years down the road, if this trajectory continues, we're going to be forced into some very significant decisions about, um, about. And that's the interesting thing. Will this become the new smoking, Hmm. you know, 50 years from now, will people look at people who are text messaging while they're driving or outside of a coffee shop on their phone and think, oh man, how sad. I can't believe people are doing that still. Or will it like massively deform our society and, you know, there'll be just a technological elite that live without their phones that are a couple percentage of the population and the rest become a mindless drone, you know, <laughs> will it become ready player one? Oh, you no, know, I don't know. It's, it'd be really interesting to see what happens. Well, I think maybe that is a good way to transition to one last question I'd like to talk about. You know, we've got the smartphone, which is a dozen years old. And then you open your book with a passage, a a well-known passage from Jesus. He's talking to weary and burdened people. Yes, I love that. Yeah. And my favorite word that Jesus speaks is the word come. 
you know, it's yeah. an invitation. Come, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, uh, wow. and you will find rest for your souls. And then he offers a strategy for how we might rest, and it is an implement of work. Yeah, he suggests. Yes. Which is an interesting sort of thing. I would yes. have expected a lazy boy or yes. a mattress or something. Not a yoke. Yeah. Not a yoke. I, I don't, I've never, I don't, didn't use a yoke today. I haven't used a yoke this last week, month or year, mm -hmm. but I know what one is because I went to seminary, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> but. A tractor, basically. Yeah. Talk about that. Talk about how it is that Jesus invitation to take his yoke is actually a beautiful invitation to rest. Yeah, I mean, first off, I just love it. Gosh, I love the invitational nature of it. I ache for it. Um, I don't know if you've ever read Dale Bruner's work on the Gospel of Matthew. He's mm. one, of, one of, I think he's considered basically one of the top living scholars on Matthew. Beautiful. And he has a great little commentary on Matthew 11 that's very similar to what you just said. And he reminds us that in, in Christian culture, we hear this easy yoke language and we smile and nod. It can sound kind of sentimental. We forget that a yoke was a work instrument. It was basically the first century equivalent of a tractor. It was yeah. you, you, you tied two oxen together and you plow a field with it. So if I'm tired, weary, and burned out, you know, or whatever Jesus language is there, um, I don't I don't want you to say, hey, I have a tractor for you. You know what I mean? And a field plow. Here's how it like come to me. I'll give you a tractor. I don't mm -hmm. want a tractor. I want to like a vacation in Kauai, you know, <laughs> or a day off, not a tractor. Exactly what you just said. But Bruner has this wonderful line. He says, instead of offering us escape, Jesus offers us equipment. Mm -hmm. And he just talks about the realism of Jesus and how Jesus is not living in a fantasy world. And he knows that life is heavy. There's a weight to life, an emotional and even spiritual weight to life. And nobody can escape it. Mm. And what the world offers us is an escape. Our phone for many of us is an escape. Entertainment is an escape. Work for many people is an escape. Church for some people, tragically, has become an escape. All sorts of things that are basically an attempt to escape from out out from under the pain of life, um, this side of Eden. And Jesus doesn't offer us a Christian version of an escape. He offers us equipment, meaning, you know, I think Bruner's language is a whole new way to shoulder the weight of life with, mm. ease, with ease, with joy, with comfort, with freedom, with him, where he's doing the heavy lifting and we're moving at his pace and we're okay. And I, I love the realism of that, the honesty of that, and the hope of that. And so, yeah, I'm like you. I just keep coming back to that passage. For years, I read Jesus' invitation, and I had this little inner voice that I was too scared to actually honestly examine that basically was pointing out to me that something was not right because I identified as a follower of Jesus, but I was tired, weary, and burned out. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that's a problem because Jesus is saying, if you come to me, if you follow me, I'll give you rest for your souls. I didn't feel rest for my soul, and I thought I was following Jesus. So I, and I just didn't want to go there, you know, because what does that mean? Does that mean Jesus is lying? Does that mean I'm bad? Does that mean this whole thing's a hoax? Cause I don't feel rest for my soul. I feel exhausted and stressed out. And I think what I've come to realize is that I, I was not living into the easy yoke. I was not living in the lifestyle of Jesus and just, and this is what I love about your work and your writing and this podcast and so many others is recapturing this idea of the way of Jesus as a way of life, as a lifestyle, mm -hmm. you know, Eugene Peterson's work about the way, the truth and the life. And I love this yeah. line there, you know, it's the way of truth wedded to the, tr I'm sorry, it's the way of Jesus wedded to the truth of Jesus that brings about the life of Jesus. Correct me Absolutely. if I'm wrong, something like that. That sounds and, right. And how in the North American church, we talk a lot more about truth than we do about way. And you got to have both. And um, so I came up in a tradition, I think like you, that had a lot to say about truth, for which I'm really grateful for, but so little to say about way. And I think, man, we have to hold those two in, together and they yeah. were never meant to come apart. And so, yeah, I think way of Jesus, lifestyle of Jesus, practices of Jesus, unhurried pace of, you know, three mile an hour per, you know, God, that that's where the money is. That's what I want to that's what I want to explore as yeah. I apprentice under Jesus. Yeah, it just strikes me. Uh, I remember in my earliest days of becoming a new follower of Christ as a high school senior, you know, I was being invited to a relationship with God. That was that was what yes. was on offer. That came through really clearly. 
it was clear uh, that it wasn't it wasn't religion. That was very clear. We none of us wanted that, whatever that yeah. meant. Um, what we were entering into as relationship, and then promptly, I was trained in a way of doing ministry that almost completely de-emphasized that wow. reality. Wow. So suddenly my ministry training was about working for God, mm-hmm. where the invitation to this life of faith had been a, an invitation to live my life with God. Yeah. And so Jesus went from being friend and Lord, yes, to being almost like boss. Yeah. And then I wasn't sure I wanted to spend any time with my boss. I'd just get more work, <laughs> you know, come on, man. Just, yeah. I'm, I'm already tired. And so I needed a new vision of the yoke as one, it's two in the yoke, and I'm one of the two, and the other is Jesus. We are collaborating. There's yeah. there's a community the what makes Abiding the with. Yeah. Oh, the what makes the work so light is we're not doing it alone. Yeah. And as Gosh, you said, the that. heavy lifting, that's not on my shoulders. Yep. That's that's a kind of a different vision of the yoke of Jesus and and in my case, maybe yours too, the even the yoke of ministry, the reason I think it felt burdensome is I felt alone in it. So yeah. therefore I felt like I was the only one carrying it. Yeah. And of course, and then I added my own weights to the yoke that made it even, even heavier. Yeah. yeah and I, you know, I had a lot of people tell me as I was coming up, Hey, you need to rely on the spirit of Jesus. Hmm. And I, which I'm grateful for The problem was, um, that was never explained to me. Nobody ever taught me how, or yeah. like, you know, and maybe I'm just kind of, a pretty pragmatic personality. I'm a, I'm a theorem and conceptual person, but I, I'm not a super sentimental person. And so like nobody, I, I got the, I got the theory of it, but I never knew how, like, how do you rely on Jesus? What does that actually mean? You know? Right. And, and like, how do like, okay, that sounds great. I'm totally exhausted. I want to rely more on Jesus. What do I do? How do I do it? And that's where some of the embodied practices and some of the internal kind of psychological emotional release mechanisms of spirituality have just been so helpful you know yeah. as i follow jesus to just move toward and again i'm not there and i think you're a lot farther down the path than i am but but i could not agree more it's something about tapping into that with jesus thing where he's doing the heavy lifting which i think brings me back to hurry because at that point you have to walk at his pace yes and i find that jesus in my experience just does not move through the world at the pace that i want to move through the world and but when i slow down and i abide and i let jesus do the heavy lifting and i just offer what i have to offer it really does feel pretty wonderful Mm -hmm. yeah it maybe it almost feels like an abundant life yeah almost something like like almost really joyful and compassionate (laughs) and enjoying god's presence and becoming my better self you know yes well uh john mark it's been such a treat to have this conversation, and maybe before we close, uh, how could those who are listening to this episode find out more about your work and how they could learn more from you? Well, they probably all have a phone because they're <laughs> listening to they're listening to a podcast. So odds, the odds are, are on their phone. You're listening to this on a smartphone. Um, I don't know the exact stat, but I'm guessing overwhelming high 90s or something. Yes. So yeah, it's easy. John Mark Comer, C O M E R, is my last name. The book's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. You can go to the website, Instagram, whatever. Uh, the church I'm a part of is called Bridgetown Church. So mm. most of my teaching comes through the Bridgetown Church podcast as well as my books. But it's the internet. It will take you to all sorts of crazy places. And <laughs> I'm sure they all sorts of good and bad things about me. But have, have, have fun. Enjoy. Mostly, mostly good stuff. Well, John Mark, again, thanks for the time. It's been a great treat to visit. I've really enjoyed our, uh, our conversation. It's such an honor, Alan, and thank you for your work. Thank you for mm. your book. I'm literally counting the days until I'm, – I'm, I'm not joking. I'm going to read it the week that my book comes out, so next week. So oh. I, I I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I yeah. can't wait to read it. I'm so excited. Oh, thanks so much. Well, I look forward to maybe having another conversation after you've had a chance to read and, and we can learn from each other some more. I would love that. Thank you. All right, my friend. If you found reading my book, An Unhurried Life, helpful, then I urge you to take a next step and get yourself a copy of John Mark's book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, wherever you usually buy books. I think you'll especially appreciate his extended treatment connecting the practice of simplicity with the slowing of our inner life. 
And I also want to let you know that we've been making extended video versions of these podcast conversations available in our unhurried community. It's an online home for growing in this unhurried way of life we talk about on the podcast. Remember, great influence begins with your life, your soul, being transformed into the fruitfully unhurried way of Jesus. We'd love to help you grow in this way. Come learn more and consider joining us at unhurriedliving.com slash community. Jim and I would love to get to know you better. And as always, we love connecting with more and more friends like you who want to rest deeper, live fuller, and lead better. Thank you.